Hello, good afternoon. Um, hi from Paraguay, from Asuncion, the capital city of Paraguay. Okay, so we're gonna work on the um, um, final stages, final sections of uh, romance. Uh, we had uh, reached that part where the uh, finger one is facing a bar chord scenario, which is undoubtedly one of the most uh, demanding works for the left hand, especially if you are in the beginning or advanced uh, stages of, uh, of guitar playing. Uh, that's the reason, and I consider actually the bar chord to be more than anything a shortcoming to classical guitar technique, meaning by that that we have to use them uh, whether we like it or not. But it's always uh, wise to try to find a fingering solution around bar chords rather than just going into bar chords as if uh, there were no other options uh, viable. Uh, now, of course, there are those scenarios where you have to use your bar chord. And uh, then uh, what comes into play is how you perform bar chords. And bar chords, although they do demand the strength uh, in the left hand, it's also true that most times uh, players use much more strength than necessary. Okay, so we'll look closely at how to perform bar chords will look also at another factor which is very important in guitar playing which is uh, the um, uh, the need and the actually urgent need on part of uh, guitar players to avoid all types of uh, left hand um, noise meaning squeaks and shrieks and slides which make uh, very undesirable noise in the left hand so things such as you know, that typical, very, very disturbing uh, uh, noise that the left hand often makes on the fingerboard. Uh, so we'll look at that aspect and also at the three different types of left hand presentations, meaning uh, the longitudinal presentation we looked at. Uh, we're going to be looking at the mixed left hand presentation and to the transversal left hand presentation. All of them in their due time. Okay, so going back to our bar uh, chord scenario, uh, where in Romance we land on the uh, B here on the 7th fret where we are uh, using both the 6th string and the 1st string uh, the Bs which are being uh, pressed by finger 1 and adding the D sharp here on the 3rd string we performed the last class this uh, arpeggio I'll do it again Look how I relax completely the left hand between bar chords, bringing the left hand down because I want you to start the practicing with the relaxations incorporated in your practice. In other words, you don't want to mount up your tension in the left hand or the right hand for that matter, but in, any one, in either one of the hands at any time because you want to learn how to play relaxed at all times. If you learn how to play relaxed, you will be very conscious of when you're entering a tense situation in playing and you will work against it. In other words, you have to be very, very aware of where your tension is being used. Okay, so going back to the scenario, relaxation, going down again. Okay, once you uh, work around the bar chord, which is gonna be the fixed scenario where the, the playing is gonna happen, what you need to do now is you, you have to make some space for finger three that's gonna be stopping the C underneath uh, finger two here on the first string in this little spot here. But this spot here is in a way uh, obstructed by the presence of finger two. So finger three has a hard time finding its way to the C. So what do we do when that is the scenario in question? So here's where the mixed presentation comes in handy. Mixed presentation is when we uh, change that long longitudinal way of uh, facing the strings to a more uh, mixed presentation. That, that means that part of your hand is going to be working in a transversal presentation and a part of your hand is going to be working in a longitudinal presentation. Now, all these terms that I'm using are simply to make our lexicon common. In other words, so that we know what we're talking about. Okay, it's common ground. And these are just terms to explain 
the technical scenario that would otherwise go without a name, which is never convenient. Now, these names are not made by, uh, they're not my creation. They were actually introduced in the classical guitar scenario by the Uruguayan maestro Abel Carrelaro, who was one of my teachers, of course, and I got very familiar with the terminology. And of course, it's um, very much used, even among other uh, disciplines and other schools of guitar. So, once you have the left hand ready and you have to make space for finger three, what you do, you push literally from the elbow forward and you break, so to say, you, you bend your wrist like that. Look, look what happens when, you are, when your wrist bends without doing any work with the fingers. Look, your fingers spread the lateral uh, expansion of the fingers augments and at the same time, the presentation changes. Look, longitudinal, transversal, just by, just by bending the wrist. And that's one thing I want you to get familiarized with. The use of your bigger muscle groups in order to perform things that the fingers ought not to do. So when you think guitar playing, I want you to make that more global and think more in terms of uh, playing apparatus rather than fingers. Okay, so look how I bring it out, I bring the wrist out and bend it in order to help finger three find a little space where to insert himself here underneath finger two on the C string one. So I'll show you how that works. I release it, bring it back. Now I have to reach an elusive D sharp on fret 11 on the first string and again I don't want to think finger finger has to reach fret 11 no I have to think playing apparatus my hand has to help finger 4 reach uh, the D sharp on string 1 and literally what you do is you bring up you, you, you bring up the elbow like that and look what happens with finger with finger 4 when you do that it's up here and without moving the finger it is taken to the D sharp that I need see so I didn't have to go into doing any of that why don't why do I want to avoid that because this type of move is very non precise fingers work best when they are working near or at their relaxed position whenever I have to move them like that not being just one finger that I'm interested in then it's when you're heading for trouble that's why we want to try to avoid at all costs this type of uh, acrobacy okay. so you go here like that and you play that with the bass then you go back to the D to the C sharp C scenario and back to the C, to the B I'll play the whole sequence, it goes like this. Try to have a glimpse at my wrist, elbow um, power. You will see the moves from that, uh, from that direction, look. In other words, you want to make this scenario as fluid musically as possible. So how do you make an, uh, your own exercise? Well, if it's going to be your own exercise, it's going to be your own exercise. Well, I will share with you what I would do. So whenever I'm facing a new scenario where my left hand, hand, my left hand or my right hand or both are facing a new scenario and I want to get myself, myself familiar with the new elements that I'm dealing with, what I do is create my own exercise. So in this particular scenario, what I would do is something like this, for example. Relax. Relax.
relax. Now look when I get to fret one, my whole body is going to get involved in the playing. Otherwise, finger four wouldn't reach. See, this is making your own exercise. Taking this scenario back to position one simply makes the work harder. It's just like when you go out jogging or running and you put weights on your ankles in order to feel heavier and develop more speed. You know how easy it feels when you remove the weights from your ankles, you feel like you're flying. This is the same thing. You're making the scenario harder in order for it to feel very easy when you do it in its real life scenario. Okay, this is the concept. Now, well, the thing I want you though to concentrate are two aspects of playing which would go otherwise unnoticed, which are the relaxing part and the no left hand squeaks part which are essential in contemporary play. See, the, the, the truth of the matter is that the contemporary player has to deal with several factors which make his playing and his practicing different from what the people in the uh, preceding generations had to face. Meaning that if you are a professional player, meaning by professional in this particular case that you make a living with the with your guitar then it's very likely that you either have to teach at college or you have your students then you have to your performance you have your recordings and you have a life of course to deal with and you will notice that if you want to keep all those things in balance because it's no point having a, a, a disorderly type of life you want to keep your things all in a way orderly and all have to in a way cooperate in making you the musicians you are you will realize that your practice has to become very efficient. And efficient practice means that you have to use all possible technical means and knowledge available today in order to make your 45 minutes, your one hour practice, whatever it is that you can afford to dedicate to guitar playing as efficient as possible. So in other words, let alone that some of the players we admire, like say Andres Segovia, had the pleasure or the honor to play well into their 90s, the truth of the matter is that most people don't get to play that much in their life. Actually, Segovia covered the life of several generations of players and literally died playing the guitar. But you also know the story of some players who were not, were not, could not afford to make it into their uh, older years due to either injuries and they had to uh, go to uh, an early retirement, which is something nobody really wants, and usually these type of problems appear when the player has not taken care of other aspects which are not so in your face when you're playing the guitar. In other words, if you're just uh, uh, working uh, you know, very tenaciously but not thinking much of what you're doing with your hands, it's very likely that you're going to be hurting yourself in the short, medium or long run. And being the life of a musician nowadays stretched well into their 80s, you want to make sure you get to your 80s and be able to perform on the guitar. So, we have already mentioned the sitting position and how important that is in order to avoid back problems, which have been the reason for retirement for many big and important guitars in our, in our time. So, now we're going to look at another aspect which is very important, which is relaxation. Relaxation means literally what it sounds. You have to generate, just as you generate a note in the plane, you must generate a point of relaxation, a place where your hand, your body relaxes, breathes. In other words, where you dissipate tension that's being building up in the plane. That has to be incorporated to the point that you have to write it down on the score. Actually, when you log into my master classes online, the 200 plus scores that I've transcribed with the fingering and everything in the key places where relaxations are called in, I write it down, relax, and you have to put it in there. Otherwise, what would happen is that you would be mounting up tension and that's never good. Okay, but the second problem related with tension is left hand noise, mainly squeaks. I'm referring to this. Although you must have heard great players from the past, 
doing a, an incredibly noisy uh, performance many times and uh, having introduced us and most of the audiences throughout the world to a very, very unpleasant uh, musical scenario, which is the presence of all these un, uh, unwelcoming uh, noises, the truth of the matter is that musically speaking, these have nothing to do with the music. And if they are present in your guitar playing, and you are using it as a way of saying, well, there's no other way of playing, you're, for one thing, wrong about that, because you can perfectly play without as much, but evenly I would go into say you could perfectly play the classical guitar without any left hand squeaks, that musically speaking are adding absolutely nothing to your playing, and which, by the way, in, to, in contemporary guitar schools, left hand squeaking is not uh, accepted, at least not as it used to be. Okay, so this is an invitation to face a real issue because the classical guitar and the classical guitarist, when they are performing for other musicians, usually other musicians uh, are wondering what is all this noise that we make with the left hand. And it's not good saying the guitar uh, is noisy when I play. That's not uh, really a good explanation. Imagine if you went and uh, actually there is the case of uh, either keyboard players or uh, or piano players, or even uh, string players who make noise with their bow or with the pedals, which has happened, they're not welcome. Those noises are not part of the music, and you have to, and they have to avoid it. And the same is true for guitar players. So, uh, what I want to uh, to to introduce to you is what I worked in for quite some time with my teacher, who was the first one to make me very aware of left hand squeaks in order to get rid of them in the playing. To the point that I really uh, the, went by in steps with him, and the first step in getting rid of uh, uh, left hand squeaks is to become to make them really like enemies of your playing. You must really not want to accept them in your playing. You must have like a rejection of them, and whenever they happen, you have to stop and look at what is causing them. I remember once uh, Maestro Carrera was playing and I was making noise with my left hand, and he said, "Stop, Renato." And he said, um, I see you're, you're, you're making perfect noises with your left hand. You're doing them so perfectly, he said, that you must have practiced them over and over again. And he made me realize that that was one thing I had never stopped to think. That if you're making noises with your left hand, it's because you never really, never really faced them as such and have never really done anything to get rid of them. And actually, you've incorporated them in your practice, and when you're performing live, or when you're performing the piece for a recording, you have all your noises showing up and saying, here I am present, and they really detract a lot from the music, okay? So, uh, how to work around string squeaks? First step, as I was saying, is make, becoming aware of them, not deaf to them. You have to listen, be, really listen to yourself, do not discard them when they happen. See what, what, what you're doing that is causing the squeak and work around the, re, the, the cause of the squeaks, okay? Now, typically, and that's where relaxation is so important. Relaxation means release the tension of the fingers from the fingerboard, and that automatically means lifting the fingers from the fingerboard. So when I go... Relax. My fingers, my left hand fingers are not making contact with the fingerboard anymore. And I move to the next position without going, I just go and then I press again. Now, the one thing that probably is going to make you kind of reluctant or, yeah, skeptic about whether to work it as I'm suggesting you do, is the fact that you might be tempted to think that if you're going to work with relaxations in order to prevent left hand squeaks, then you are probably going to lose your tempo or you're going to need more time to perform certain passages, which is only true in the study section of your work. When you're working, when you're practicing the piece and you're trying to get away around the squeaks of your left hand, that's when you're going to be taking some time to see what your left hand is doing in order to, to avoid the squeaks. But then, once you've learned the skill, your hand will just do it very fast to the point that you will almost not see anything strange happening in the left hand, when in fact it is. 
There is like, typically what the musician has to do is lift the finger perpendicularly to the strings, not to the side like that, because that would call, cause a squeak with the left hand. And move to the next position in a, with a parable, like a, like a semi-circle in the air where you are doing this type of movement around the fingerboard. That's a way around the string squeaks in general terms. And you will find uh, different uh, nuances and ways of working around the string squeaks, but you are definitely invited to work around that. Look how, for example, if I want to do something like uh, move my bar chord up and down, like... Uh, this would be the musically correct way of doing it. The non-so-musically correct way, way of doing it would be going like that around the fingerboard because that would be noise. That's got nothing to do with music. So you have to... And I can do it as fast as I want without losing the beat. So all that really happens is that your relaxations will get, are going to become faster and faster as you perform them. Your hand is going to be relaxing continuously and you're going to be, you'll be getting, uh, uh, taking care of all the left hand squeaks in general, okay? So keep those squeaks under control. They are not welcome. Uh, uh, not welcome, okay? Okay, so once we've worked around the bar chord here, what you do is you relax, Go to the B again, like in the beginning. Keyword, relax. You have to incorporate a relaxation before you go. You just, don't just go straight to the B, no. Allow your hand to relax and go to the B. Did I take a lot of time to do that? Yes, I did. But as you practice the piece, your hand is going to become very fast to the point that the, the hand is much faster than the eye. When I play this piece live, look how fast I do the change, but although your eyes are going to tell you that I'm not relaxing, I actually am. Look how fast I do it. I relaxed for a fraction of a second while going to the B because I learned how to do the move and I mastered it to do it real fast to the point that it's not visible, but it's there. So whatever you do, Avoid string squeaks. They're always the worst way out you can find. Whatever other solution you find is going to be preferable to string squeaks. Fact of the matter. So once you restart the piece, because you're going to start off again here, you go towards the end. And the end is very similar to the beginning. You only have a B to play here with a bass. Here what you do is you change your presentation. You come in with a very nice longitudinal presentation and you're going to be changing to a transversal presentation. Transversal presentation means that keeping your hand relaxed with your fingers in this relaxed position, what you do is you rotate using your thumb behind the neck as a pivot where you are using it to rotate. And if you keep, look at my fingers, they are not moving. They are keeping their relaxed position and I'm changing their presentation on the fingerboard. See? This is what I'll be doing back here, look. And then I just stop the B on the fifth, the A on the third, and the F sharp on the first string. And I go... I lower finger four on the G. I lift it. Again, I'll show you the move. Using the open string E, I allow myself the time to rotate. I go back to a, an almost a longitudinal presentation. Actually, I'm going to get into a mixed presentation. I lift finger three, I rotate back. I put finger two on the E on the fourth string, like here. So again, I'm here and I go to here. And here I do one arpeggio with the fourth string, one arpeggio with the fifth string on the B. I 
right, boost finger three on the G on the third on the sixth string, third fret. Lift it and again I'll do the whole sequence from the B. several schemes that you have to break. I remember when I was younger, I was uh, starting off, I had a teacher who used to say that in order to keep your left arm in the right position, in the right place, you had to place a book underneath, uh, just like you would place something like this, between your elbow and your body, and that never had to fall down. In other words, if, you, if it fell on the floor, it meant that you were separating your elbow from your body, which in the old school of guitar playing was seen as a, as a big mistake, you know? That was really, really one of the worst advices that I received, along with many of my contemporaries. The, the, the old school of guitar faced guitar playing in a totally different way. And although we do learn from the past, and of course we extract whatever is good and whatever we can apply to the present, it's also true that there is a lot of stuff that we have to completely discard. At least uh, examine them, look at them from our intellectual perspective and decide which of these things are really going to be working with us towards the achievement of a goal or whether they're going to be uh, 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 something that's going to be working against us, like a, like a uh, yeah, like an effect of technique. And some of those advices from the past are really, really bad. To the point that, actually, just as I was telling you here, what is required is that the elbow uh, moves away from the body. And you will see a lot of that happening when guitar players play. Okay. Then again, remember that the larger muscle groups make your playing more precise and, and invite your hands to ask less injuries. You know, I deal with a lot of my students going through all types of injuries due to faulty ways of playing. Focal dystonia and all types of uh, right hand and left hand, uh, 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 very, very uh, handicapping uh, illnesses due mostly to uh, faulty sitting positions. And I'm not kidding, I mean, it's a serious matter because you have to really project your career throughout the years. And the body, uh, uh, you know, you've seen how the contemporary school of guitar works around adapting the instrument to the guitar player and not the other way around, which used to be a, the approach back a uh, hundred years ago, okay? Now, uh, when you go, uh, I've realized in my own experience that as I worked my way around string squeaks, I was perfecting my technique because usually if you're making a lot of string squeaks you're not using a very a polished technique there's no way around that there's no doubt that if, you, if you're going to do something like uh, there you go that scale cannot possibly be as beautiful as So one requires a more sloppy approach, a more, yeah, uh, non-caring approach. The other one requires a more musical approach, which eventually is going to force you to incorporate technical means that are very good for your health. Because in order to, you have to release tension, do like a trail in the air where you, and that is always good. While the other approach is keeping your fingers always tense and you're adding a very, very unpleasant uh, noise on the strings, okay? I invite you to listen to great players that make very little noise. If you listen to the Segovia of the 1960s, his technique was pretty much uh, at a better place than it used to be later in his life. When you hear Segovia in his late 80s, you, you can, uh, almost, um, it's almost unbearable. Same is true with John Williams. John Williams, when he started off, when he was a young player, he was uh, very noisy. Then he went polishing his technique as the technique was demanding more, less noisy uh, performing. And his last, uh, in his last performances before he retired, he was much less noisy. Other players had to use other approaches. For example, for instance, uh, the American Christopher Parkney, 
in the 80s when, uh, when the guitar school was demanding much less noise than he and his uh, classmates were doing, they started using what were called the recording strings, which were strings that were polished to a level where you could uh, drag your fingers without doing much noise, but those strings were really poor. And the way around the noise is not uh, tricks like that, because it's the same as those people who have a problem with the weight. You can either go and have a bypass uh, done to your stomach or to your digestive system via surgery, or you can start eating less, which is much more healthy and much more wise an approach, okay? The same thing is true with the noise on the classical guitar. The way out is not to make strings less noisy. The way around it is to play with a more efficient technique. And that's when, in the 80s, Carlevaro appeared with all these very good solutions to the point that nowadays the norm is to play without making string squeaks, okay? Now, going back to what I was saying, uh, how do you deal with the concept? As I said, the most important thing is to just not become friends with your squeaks. Just, just make them something you cannot stand. And when they happen, see how to work around them. That's the best advice I can give you because it's going to be by itself one of the best vehicles to a, to a much more solid technique. Okay? Now, so one thing I encourage you to practice, and that's where, where the metronome is a very great uh, uh, companion. The metronome is good for scales, but scales not just play to be fast because, listen, Guitar players, no matter how fast you play, we are not fast, okay? Any piano player in their third, fourth year in the conservatory, or a violin, a fiddler, is always much faster than any classical guitarist could ever be. So let alone that we are sometimes pushed to trying to be fast when we play, the classical guitar is not an instrument to impress on that front. We want to, at all costs, work around them because for one thing you're going to be playing and it's going to be much more pleasurable when you record those very ugly squeaks are not going to be there. And when other uh, uh, instrumentalists uh, like a pianist and even the, the public are going to hear you, they will appreciate your playing a lot better because your technique is going to be more polished. Okay? Does it take more work? Yes, but just at the beginning until you incorporate the correct moves in your playing. So I was talking about the, the, the scale and the, the chromatic scale, which is a very good school to work around squeaks, and we use it as a benchmark to work with. So I insert my, my, my metronome at that speed, and let's work on the fourth string, because you want to work the chromatic scale on the fourth string because it's one of the bass strings, and that's where most of the squeaking happens, on the fourth, fifth, and sixth string. So, uh, if you made the chromatic scale on the first, it would be more forgiving as a string, so you could afford to do some not so good moves and still get away with the noise. But on the fourth string, there's no way around noise unless you use the proper technique. So we'll, we'll, I'll show you first in slow motion without the without the metronome how you would go around making a scale on the first on the fourth string. So you go. When you get here, you have to say relax. Lift your finger off the fingerboard, go to the indecision, and go. If I showed you very slowly what I would be doing if I were playing fast, this is what I would do. Like a, like a semicircle in the air, like a parable. you'll be able to do it fast, as fast as you need, okay? So remember that music is what we deal with, not speed. Speed is totally back C in your technique. So this is how you would play the fourth string. Now one thing that is very good that's going to help you master the changes of position is to play twice each note. Go. Don't 
don't mind if at first you kind of land in the wrong place. Because what's going to be happening is that you're going to, be, you're going to need to become very precise in your left hand uh, displacements. And that's part of the polishing of your technique that we are aiming at. So put down the metronome and go. and you become a silent type of player. Incorporate it in all your playing. Whenever a squeak happens, look at your left hand, see what's causing the squeak. Usually it's one finger lifting in the wrong way or not being lifted at all, which is causing all the trouble when the rest of the hand is working properly. So I'll play the whole first part of Romance with all the moves incorporated so that you can listen to it and, and please take, uh, make sure you notice how I change presentations from a longitudinal presentation to a mixed presentation and to a transversal presentation. How the bass is present every four beats and how the sound is always uh, constant and very evened out with only the first string protruding over the rest. Yes. Okay, so thank you very much again for uh, being here with me this afternoon. Bye-bye from Asuncion, Paraguay.